Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer, and with me is my good friend, Deborah Miro, certified Alexander Technique instructor. And today's topic, of course, we always have something planned and then we go <laughs> off sideways. So we're going to go on a little sidebar where we've mm -hmm. been talking about postures, horse postures and balance. And we will get to the basic balance posture and the tensegrity conversation. But um, but things come up during the week and it's sort mm -hmm. of top of mind. So today's topic, we're going to take a sidebar into turning around aggression in horses. Mm. Dealing with snarky, pushy, aggressive horses because a lot of horse owners, like I would say predominantly are women, and dealing with aggression in our horses is not an easy thing for most women. So today's topic will be, what do we call it? Turning around our aggressive horse or just ag aggressive horses. Maybe that's mm -hmm. just the title yeah. of the podcast. I don't know. It'll come to me as we go. <laughs> <clears throat> But I mean, and it's so funny. I know we go off topic, but I think all of these conversations as little pieces of our life with horses, mm -hmm. like I'm really happy that the thank you to the new subscribers and, you know, people are starting to subscribe on YouTube and following us on the podcast channels with Horse Geeks Podcast. And I have to say, it's like every time we do this podcast, I feel like I'm sticking a little message in a bottle and <laughs> casting it out into the ocean. Who and knows? Yeah, it makes yeah, me, who knows? Who knows? Who knows who's <laughs> going to listen to this or gain benefit and, you know, just putting these different ideas out there as strategies or tools or things to think about that we, I know both of us, our intention is to really be helpful to help yeah help the horse and rider kind of restore that relationship that mutually beneficial relationship yeah that's maybe kind of coming apart at the seams right now and anybody who clicked on this podcast to listen to titled aggressive horses um right now you probably have a relationship with your horse that's really on the rocks oh yeah that's, that's, you know, you're considering, do I retire the horse? Do I sell the horse? Do I find someone else? Because dealing with a horse that turns towards what's called the fight defensive strategy, that's what aggression is. And when a thousand pound horse decides that's the strategy for me, it is a serious force to contend with. It's, it's scary. It's yeah. downright scary. It's scary. And Especially, horses, like you said, for women. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, out comes all the typical advice. Like what I've heard is, show them who's boss. Don't let them get away with that. Punish that. Don't let them do that. You know, those kind of mentalities, because what's super hard in that relationship between a person and a horse that's using the fight defensive strategy which is possible for all horses right it's all it's like we have every emotion and capability of that also yeah that's why yeah. i hate 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 horse <laughs> personality categories i go oh I don't, that's too funny i don't even like them for people because i go we all have tendencies but to pigeonhole mm -hmm. an individual Oh, he's an aggressive horse. No, he's a fearful horse. He's a fearful horse using the fight defensive strategy. Mm -hmm. And most horses, because most horses, like naturally horses are more a flight animal. They'd rather right. run away than fight. Stallions have a little bit stronger tendency towards fight because they're sort of the protector of the herd right? But all horses have the potential of right. using that fight defensive strategy. And a lot of them use it when they become 
so uncomfortable in their body that movement is no longer the best option for safety. Then Well, that's they a go, good way to put it. yeah. And it's sort of just like us. I go, even if my tendency as my first choice of defense when I'm fearful is flight, if those exits are barred and I've got no options and I'm still in fear, you bet your ass I'm going to fight, right? Right. You're going to come out swinging. Or it's like, you know, don't mess with the mother bear or the mother tiger, right? That protective instinct can lead to aggression, right? But I think the And most... it could, it could be, it, like you said, uncomfortable in their own skin. And that could be a multitude of things. You know, that could be an actual physical issue. It could be an inflammatory response. It could be, who knows, I would a past say nine, trauma. nine times out of 10, there's a physical discomfort in the body that's now at a level where flight is not going to be easy or sustainable, right? We don't Interesting. know if that discomfort is a pain, has reached the level of pain, or if it's just poor coordination, if it's just instability, if it's just, um, you know, any kind of, like you said, inflammation in the muscle, Yeah. tendon, ligament, joint. You know, there's something going on in the body that has now made flight less of a possibility. And, you know, to come to think of it, um, working part-time in the holistic veterinary practice I do, we've seen these kind of responses with Lyme. Oh, yeah, because Yeah. that can feel like kind of an arthritic pain throughout Mm-hmm. all the soft tissues. So when our body doesn't feel good, movement doesn't feel good, that means the get away from defensive strategy through moving away is less of an appealing option, right? But if, if the fear is still there, right? So the four primary defensive strategies for horses and humans, first, the fear button is pushed, right? The fear is there first, then the defensive strategy is how we cope with the fear. So the, the, the two primary defensive strategies are fight and flight. And flight means increasing movement and moving away from. Fight is the opposite defensive strategy. You resist moving. And if you move, you go towards. Right. So that's why fight can lead to aggression in the extreme version. The moderate version might be, you know, pushing us over, stepping on our feet in the cross ties, nipping at us, or just a really snarky kind of expression. That might be the moderate version. And the mild version might just be sort of the in your pocket horse who's <laughs> you think is affection, but they're really sort of shoving you around in a semi polite way. Like that might be the mild version of that defensive strategy. So the fear, we could also use a synonym instead of like a high level of fear, a low level of fear could just be insecurity. Right. Right. I have So, one here that's very insecure. Yeah. yeah. So they don't feel confident and safe in their own skin No, or, or they're in very this clingy. environment. Yeah, they're very clingy, want to be next to you in your pocket, like you said. And we just think that's so cute, don't we? No, and I think this is such an important topic to talk about because uh, horses that start to use the defensive strategy of fight suffer the most in our horse world. Oh, yeah, they do. Because humans, as natural, you know, predator instincts, when someone fights us, our first instinct is to match that and fight back. Mm -hmm. We're very good at fighting. Right. So 
if we match a horse's fight energy, which we have to remember is is rooted in fear and insecurity, right? They're questioning their safety at the least or they're terrified at, at, at the most, right? So here they are already uncertain and fearful and they're expressing it in a way that we're perceiving as aggression. Pushy, snarky, biting, kicking, striking, all of that is, you know, mm -hmm. towards us. And humans, especially trainers, I got to say, mm -hmm. the more capable we become with different tools and strategies, the worse we become, you know, yeah. and it's like trainers, if nothing else, have learned to become effective with horses. That's it. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Effective. So trainers are sort of the worst ones dealing with that kind of horse. And I'm, I'm in that group, you guys. I'm in that group. And what I would see a lot is the more effective people became, they still were not overriding the human instinct of matching fight with fight, matching aggression with aggression. So it became a battle. Oh, literally. That's what you're saying. Right? And there's going to be a winner and a loser in a battle. And that is why horses that gravitate into this defensive strategy, they really suffer in the human environment. They get whacked a lot. They get, you know, insane amount of leverage applied to them until they submit. Right? But one of my favorite things to say in the horse world is a horse, what, how does it go? I always stumble on this a little it should be easier because it's my favorite saying, but a horse convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. We yeah. haven't changed the opinion our horse has. We haven't right. gotten to the root issue, which is fear and insecurity by making them obedient or making them submit or leveraging them into compliance that underlying root fear and insecurity is going to keep living there and growing, mm. right? And a lot of horses that are handled by trainers who use harsh methods become really good at fighting. And that problem wow. just escalates, right? They learn their lesson in that first battle and they come to the next battle more prepared. Mm. And that's how these horses just fail in the human environment. So with most horse owners who love their horse, you don't want to go into that battle. The battle doesn't feel good. And I'm aware enough as a small woman, there were horses yeah. where I go, if I go into battle with this horse, I'm going to lose. Like, right. No uncertain terms. This horse is going to stomp me into the ground or this horse is going to eat my lunch. Like I'm going to lose. I had that much humility to just go, I can't fight with this horse. I will get hurt. I'll lose. And it won't accomplish anything. So I think what that's a key word I uh, that you said. We shouldn't fight the horse back. You know what I mean? But to claim our own space, that's okay. Well, and that sort of brings us to the point. If yeah. we understand that the horse is essentially fearful or insecure, they're just using a strategy to sort of test us to see if we're capable of defend of of being a good defender. Mm hmm. Right. Because if we can defend ourselves from a micro test or a little test within our herd, then I, the, that horse knows I'm qualified to defend both of us. Right. But if I can't defend myself during this little test within our herd, then in the horse's mind, they become responsible for protecting us. Mm -hmm. So what that translates into is that horse expects you to listen when when he says so or she says so, right? Mare or gelding or stallion, doesn't right. matter. 
So when the horse pushes us, our job is to follow orders because in our little herd of two, the horse that pushes us around all the time or acts aggressively towards us and we back away, that convinces the horse that in this herd of two, the horse is the one responsible for the safety of both of us. We're not qualified, oh. right? So especially with women, because women, sometimes we have to really lose our temper before we defend ourselves, right? The threat That's has- interesting. To... Really lose our temper. So yeah, so we feel, because we don't know middle ground. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. As women, we're taught not we're to take up space. Or to sort of work around the kids, the right. husband. The, like, we're pretty adaptable. That's a strong quality True. in women that is a gift. But sometimes that adaptability can work against us. Right. Right. And in this particular case, working with our own horse, who's now becoming aggressive, this is the time where adaptability works against us. Yeah. It's still a great quality. It's just not going to be what's needed in that particular situation. So what helps me personally, and this has helped me deal with some seriously aggressive horses, is I never have the intention of fighting or entering a battle or showing the horse who's boss. I just have this intention that I have every right to defend myself. Right. And your space. Against any attack. So right. if I use a whip as an extension of my body to increase my personal space, or I use a tool, a rope of any sort, I'm not even really looking at the horse, right? So I'm not meeting that sort of challenge, like eye to eye, face or to like, face. I always think of two <laughs> bulls sort of right. ready to lock horns, right? Or right. Locking horns kind of aggression. I just go, I own this space and I have the right to defend myself. And by taking that intention and holding that thought, it changes my energy from mm -hmm. entering the argument into sort of ignoring the problem, right? So I'm aware when the horse comes on the attack, I use everything I've got to say, you can go anywhere but here. Right. There you go. Express it in a different direction. Yeah. Take, <laughs> take it somewhere else, dude, right? Not here. <laughs> just not here and that's not at me not at me and not threatening mm -hmm. my safety within this personal space bubble and I can make my personal space bubble I always think minimum is sort of an arm's length but I can make right. it 10 feet 20 feet 50 feet if I feel really threatened and right. that's interesting because I just see in the herd dynamics of my two mares together, um, the my finer things, my lead mare, her bubble is huge. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I went to bring them in this morning from getting them off the grass and I'm leading her back. And my other mare is probably 20 feet away and she's pinning her ears like, don't come any closer. Yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a big bubble. And, the and other they're not horse... aware that they have a big bubble, some of them. But the other horses are. Oh, the other horse knew. Yeah. She was like, yeah, not going in there. <laughs> yes. Stay out of that. Mess. No, and one of the funniest sort of best illustration of, of talking about this was watching my little 14-2 Arabian being turned out with a new mare that came in training that was like a 16-2 thoroughbred mare. <laughs> and they had this huge pasture they were sharing. And these two mares were trying to work out, it, all it is is herd dynamics so that they both feel secure together, right? And so my little tiny mare would ball herself up, 
pin her ears, right? <laughs> Make her little missile face. And she would just charge aggressively at this huge mare, right? And this huge mare without moving would look back over her shoulder, pin her ears and start kicking the space. Is so, like, And wow. we're talking, these two mares were at least 50 feet apart, maybe a wow. hundred feet apart, huge distance between them. But all this body language communications mm -hmm. going on. And, and screaming, I imagine. And so the thoroughbred mare, who wasn't budging, who was just saying with her hind leg, better not come here, you might get kicked. Right? Mm -hmm. My little mare, who was on the attack as, with a fight defensive strategy, which is not her usual MO at all, right. that she used at that time, she would gallop towards this mare. The mare would stand there kicking the air and my mare would veer off at least 20 <laughs> feet, <laughs> at least 20 feet away. Like there was never a physical interaction ever. They worked it out at this huge distance. And it was exactly that. My mare, for whatever reason, decided in her insecurity with this new horse in her pasture, right, had to see who is this other horse. So I'm going to go on the attack and check this out and see, right. right, if this mare can defend herself from me, then I can relax knowing she's got the safety for both of us. If I can attack this mare and she moves away and gets scared, then I know I'm in charge of the herd. Suit. There you go. Right. That's what's being worked out. Right. So with our horse, if we can put a halter on them, they don't see us as a predator anymore. We're in the herd. So once we're in the herd, it's important to our horse to know who's in charge of the herd's safety. Right. And that's why they come at us aggressively. <clears throat> and so we don't have to do anything to the horse at all. We just have to sort of hold our ground. We just have yeah. to ward off the attack in order to maintain the safety of ourself. That has nothing. It's not a punishment to the attacker. It's not against the attacker. It's not even a battle with the attacker. It's just sort of saying, that's not going to fly here. Right. That is not going to happen to me. Right. And I think women have an easier time thinking in terms of that. Right. So we're not aggressing. We're defending ourselves. Interesting. And when we prove to the horse and even the most aggressive horses that I've had to have physical contact with in order to protect myself, I got to say, most of them try it once to three times. Mm -hmm. And when I'm pretty certain that I have the right to defend myself by any means necessary, they quit attacking. Because mm -hmm. now, ironically, and this is hard for people to wrap their head around, once you've proven to a horse that you're capable of defending yourself, you qualify in their minds as a protector of the herd. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you qualify, not only do they quit testing you, they relax. Yeah. And they, they listen to you because they go, this one's qualified. So if she tells me go over here or go over there, I'm going to voluntarily listen because it might have to do with the safety of the herd. Right. And when we look at aggression that way, it's a completely different lens than our human instinct that we either have to get away from the battle or head straight into the battle. Straight into it. Yeah. Those just are to, not just the to only be options. neutral. But claiming our own <laughs> space is, you know, for some women may be very difficult. Oh, yeah. And, and that's where yeah. <clears throat> the horse as your personal sort of mentor within the herd. And I saw this happen with my older gelding and my young horse, my young gelding. Every day, the old gelding would go over to the young one and 
bite him as hard as he could. <laughs> right? Until finally the young one learned to move away. Right? Ah. So the young one didn't defend his space and didn't move away. And so the old one is thinking, this young monkey is going to get us killed. Ah. Right? This is a problem in the herd. He doesn't defend his space and he doesn't move away. So my old gelding went over and I, you know, the poor young one had the white hairs to prove it from multiple bites. But I kind of watched it and it wasn't anything, you know, that required a vet call. It was it was gentle enough, but when he would break the skin because he was serious, right? right? And right. he's serious in his mentoring of the other horse that if you missed my snark face, if you missed me coming towards you with pushy energy, then I'm going to follow through with a bite. And you either right. are going to stand your ground and get me to back off, or you're going to move away. And then we know who's calling the shots. Right. And so. And that's, that's <clears throat> a good point about moving the feet. Because I see a lot of people not realize how important, it's like a dance, you know, how important it is if the horse comes towards you and you back up, moving your feet, the horse is moving you. Done and dusted right there. <laughs> <laughs> Even if we but, shrink, right? <clears throat> yeah, right. So I was working with a very young girl who has a young chestnut mare that we're developing together. And all of a sudden, this mare charged her. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had to work with this exact thing and nip it in the bud because that's going to only escalate if we don't deal right. with it. Right. So there's this great TED talk. And if I can find the link, I'll put it in the description box. Oh, yeah, but please do. Somewhere in one of these TED talks, there's a woman who talks about the physiological changes that we make by adopting different postures with our body. And she wow. said, you know, before a job interview or when you feel a lack of confidence, she goes, put yourself in the Wonder Woman stance. Dun, dun, right? dun. Hands on hips, legs spread apart, big and strong, or the posture of like leaning back, you know, hands threaded behind the head, elbows out, that these postures, when we're hmm. kind of lacking confidence, actually boost our confidence. Like there's I this like whole that. study on how it actually works. So one of the things I will say, especially to women, is let's start with the Wonder Woman stance. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> and that all of a sudden shifts the energy. And that's right. what our horse is reading. I right? think that's so important because we don't think that they're reading us as we're coming in there. If I'm going in there fearful in thought, I'm going to be exuding that expression. Exactly. Everywhere. Everywhere. It's a physiological body-mind connection. So right. if you have a thought that's linked to a fearful emotion, that's going to be expressed in your muscle tone, body language, and posture. Mm -hmm. And the energy, like I always say, that we're broadcasting, that mm -hmm. the horses pick up easily, even though we think it's subtle, right? So as soon as we adopt the Wonder Woman stance, right? And then sometimes I'll just draw in the dirt, you know, a 10 foot circle around the person. Yeah, that's a good idea. And there's the visual line, right? Or stick the whip out as far as it can reach and the tip of the whip is the edge of your bubble right so instead of chasing the horse with the whip i go you use the whip as just a physical definition of your space you swirl it around yourself right you, you randomly swing it around you do something a little crazy right and if the horse is coming at you and they hit the whip that's their problem. 
but I'm not aggressively aiming the whip towards the horse. I go, And if you that, want to poke your nose in this fan, right? If I'm swinging right. something back and forth round and round like a fan, I go, be my guest. Try to poke your nose in here. It's not going to feel good. That's how I defend my space if needed. And it goes back to um, the that article, The Lost Sixth Sense by David Gerlich, that we they live in that kinesthetic world of mm -hmm. sphere and i think the more technology we get into our lives we are losing that in us as humans that it's not uncommon like a lot of times especially women dealing with aggressive horses in that scenario the first thing we have to do or sort of the first step is deciding what we feel yeah like I can think we feel it yeah what do we feel and sort of giving a name to that feeling whether an, an emotional feeling right or sometimes it's a physical feeling like mm. what we call butterflies right butterflies in the stomach that's a physical sensation linked to the emotion of uncertainty mm -hmm. a little bit of fear Right. So we might experience it as a physical feeling that we have to describe or an emotional feeling that we have to describe. But so many adult learners have been, you know, in the brain. And we've in... talked to the cutoff, I call it the disconnect between the brain and the body. Right. Yeah. It's like a survival skill, I think. Well, we think all learning occurs in the brain. Well, and it doesn't like the heart. I don't agree. <laughs> well, even like one of the big aha things of, from researching some of the Heart Math Institute work is that there are more ascending nerves from the heart to the brain than there are descending nerves from the brain to the heart. And so I go, that tells us the information has a different direction of flow more often than we think right it's not our brain it's what we feel that yeah. is then sort of maybe translated like, by yeah, our brain i agree and that whole thing about um as humans having the capability of remembering something from the past or projecting into the future that to me is also um can really confuse the situation if you're playing that game in your head instead of just being present in the moment with what you have right especially if you've got a history with a horse like I do my big mare of how many injuries I've had from her I it's it's taking me quite some time to work through that post-traumatic stress and using the Alexander technique to help me but But like you said at the very beginning, the reason all of that was happening was because she wasn't comfortable in her skin. <laughs> it exactly. Wasn't, it wasn't an attack on me personally. It's not, you know, don't take it personal. I'm not comfortable in my skin. You're my human. Help me. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's and, and what that's fight how, is too. That's fight. That's, that's exactly please what, help me. what we need to think in our minds because it goes against our human instinct oh gosh does it for yes so when a horse is aggressive towards us the first thing we have to realize is it's fear-based mm -hmm. whether it's a little insecurity or terror it's fear-based so once we understand it's fear-based we suddenly see that entering the battle is not going to reduce fear. It's going to increase fear. Mm -hmm. So if we match fight with fight, it's only going to make the horse more fearful, not less fearful, right? Because now they're afraid of us and whatever else they had on their mind. Right. Right. So the most compassionate thing we can do is ask ourselves, how do we reduce fear? Mm-hmm. Right. And the first thing is like with you, with your big mirror, we've worked together a long time. Uh -huh, yeah. The first question to ask ourselves is, 
at what distance from this horse do I feel safe? Right. And with you and, and your big mare, we started on a 25, 20 foot, foot lunge line. line. <laughs> right. That was where you said, I feel safe at this Here. distance. Right. right. And that's if we don't do what we need to do to feel safe ourselves, we certainly can't guide the horse and our horse into a feeling of safety. Right. So the first thing is we have to set up what is the distance we're going to interact with our horse. Okay. So do we feel safer if our horse is loose or do we feel safer if our horse is on a halter and rope where we feel we have more control? Right. right. First question. Then we set up the situation and go, okay, what length of rope or what amount of space do I need to feel safe? Like how big so, is your bubble? Yeah. Right. So if I want a big bubble, I'm going to grab a tool that's taller than me <laughs> because now I can take up more space with a tool that's taller than me. So like this little girl who I worked with, once we got the Wonder Woman stance down, we went into the tack room and looked at ropes and whips mm -hmm. that made her double her size. Right. And I go, now you're double the size. So you can take up this much space to protect yourself, right? And then we could start to work with the horse. Right. Right. So we can work with the horse, letting them sort of try to come into our space over and over and run into the tool we happen to be using. Or we could just stand there and do nothing and sort of see. Does the horse feel calmer just because we're in this relationship of sort of noticing each other, doing something together? If that's instantly triggering aggression in my horse, then I need to be with my horse until my horse no longer feels fearful and defensive if it's related to me. Right. Right. And all you have to do is be present without increasing the horse's fear. But you and can't that's truly be present, like you said. I mean, that word has lots of bound built intensification around it. You know, you've truly got to be present in your own skin and realize the body language you're transmitting, even through your thoughts. Yeah, yes and no, because I it's a little bit you're allowing the horse to have their own process. That right. we're, not, we're not responsible for. And I think that's another thing with women mm. is that if our horse is aggressive True. or anxious, somehow it's our fault. It's personal. They it's take personal. it personal. It's our fault. Yeah. My kid doesn't like me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> but I think that takes away the sovereignty of the individual. I go, mm -hmm. it's not respecting the uniqueness of that horse's personality, thoughts, feelings, choices. So sometimes like I have a highly anxious horse I'm move, working with right now mm -hmm. and everything is about move and get away, move and get away. Uh, so we're having to work on developing the skill of halt mm -hmm. with calmness and acceptance. And she used to bounce between fight and flight. Right. right? So I would have to say, we set up a situation. I grab a chair and my phone because I'm going to be there a while, right? It's not easy for this horse to maintain halt. But if she comes at me, I defend myself. And if she tries to get away from me, I have a halter and lead rope that says you can run into the end of the rope. That's as far away from me as, as you can, can go. go. So it's like setting up a donut. Right. I'm in the inner ring of the donut. Uh -huh. There's an outer edge to the donut and the horse can do whatever they want within the donut. Right. If they come at me, they meet the edge of the inner donut hole. And if they try to get away, the lead rope or rope that I'm using says there's the edge. There's the outer boundary of that flight pattern. Right. You can only go this far away and you can only come this close. But if you're in the donut, do what you want. Right. 
right? <clears throat> so the only corrections I have to make are defending myself or holding on to her if she tries to run away. And meanwhile, I go just kind of work on it yourself. And I check my emails, I answer text messages, I go through my phone and I sit there because it's not personal. I think that's it's the not key a judgment. is that it's that <clears throat> it's not personal and don't pass judgment on it. Yeah. I go, this is for that's you to huge. work out. You obviously have a very high level of fear. I don't know why, but she mm -hmm. has lameness issues. So letting her express flight is no longer an option. Even though she's comfortable enough, she would gallop around for an hour. I go, knowing what's going on with her body, her back, her feet, I go, that's not going to help us. And it might create a big setback. So I know you're not good at halt, but we're just going to stand here until you learn how to think your way into feeling safe rather than running your being way reactive yeah and being They're, reactive yeah and i i think <clears throat> that's a good point because getting them to the point of what we call in the alexander community the pause you know mm -hmm. or being able to see sometimes you can tell a horse or a person is getting better when they start to go to that escalation point that they used to use and then they go oh wait a minute that really wasn't serving me very well. And it doesn't when, feel good. It doesn't feel good because doesn't if they're starting good. to feel some good juju, they're going to, they're going to, and it happens in people. You're going to go towards your habit, but then you're going to remember, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't really help me very much anymore. It doesn't, doesn't feel good anymore. It doesn't feel good anymore. Yeah. And that's like my first year in Alexander school because you start to get to a place where you learn something different. It feels better. You seek that, even though you may not have all the where for all at that moment of how, but you still stop and pause and go, I'd rather pause and wait for something else to come along than to go over into that other thing I used to use. Yeah. Because the stress yeah. hormones are not a comfortable feeling. Right. The pleasure hormones are what we love. Yeah. And, and so to me, it's a matter of time to let any person or horse work through that hormonal that mm -hmm. stimulation, right? And I find with fear, whether it's people or horses, if I keep adding stimulus, even though we think we're guiding and correcting and blah, 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 the more stimulus I throw in the mix when somebody, whether a horse or a person, is now in a state of fear expressing fight or flight, the more stimulation I add in, the more it tends to confuse and escalate. So my strategy is always reduce stimulation. And I go, knock yourself out in the donut. I go, if you want to stand there and look at me with a stink eye, be my guest. You just can't come here and do anything about it. Right. If you want to stand there with your eyes wide and a high neck looking like a deer in the headlights, I go, go for it. I don't need to add any more stimulation to what, all that chaos you're already coping with internally. Right. 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 And we think we're helping by making suggestions, corrections, giving guidance. I go, it's not helpful when the nervous system is in overwhelm, Over, which is what yeah. fear feels like. Right. And it's sort of that one more thing that just that that predatory in, thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, even yeah. for us, when we're afraid, people coming at us with multiple demands or suggestions or helpful tips starts mm -hmm. to feel overwhelming. And we go into more fight or more flight because we're just overstimulated. And that's what our horses go through too. The nervous system is no different. And right. the, hormo the hormonal cascade is no different right? That's kind of the same. So I've learned to just sit it out. I yeah, go, just claiming your own space 
and I, what I think what comforts, like you say, what comforts horses and, and people is leaving them be, but maintaining your own presence, your own self, mm -hmm. not getting sucked into their drama energy, but just arriving. I did that podcast we did quite a few, while ago about when I we walked into a room of second or third graders to Alexander teachers and it was total chaos and we instead of trying to control the children which the teacher was doing stop 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 we actually got yoga mats and laid down and did constructive rest yeah yeah so it's not want against... to be part of the chaos we didn't want to be we wanted to own our own space remain calm and let them know that that was okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I look at a person or a horse <laughs> in a state of fear, knowing the complexity of that, the effect it has on mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, I'm that friend who says, I'm here to help. Tell me what you need. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to push my idea on you of right. what I think you need, right? So I'm going to stand by, but this is not my circus, not my monkeys, right? right. <laughs> this is for you to have to recover from in your figure own out. way yep. and figure out what works for you. So the fewer suggestions I give, the better. But I'm physically present. I go, I'm here if you want to connect and want to start a conversation with me, but I'm not going to demand a conversation. I'm not going to demand obedience. I'm not going to demand. I go, you can't run away and you can't run me over. Those are the only the boundaries only I rules. need. <laughs> Those are the only two rules. You can't run away and you can't run me over, but the rest of it is up to you. You do. And you. That, that to me boils down to self carriage. I mean, that's really Self-carriage. It's not emotional. Self, yeah, it's not. Emotional self-carriage self is not just body posture. It's right. the whole package of mental, emotional, psychophysical management of yeah, the self. Because you can't separate. It's, no, you can't. It's, it's one body. It all intertwines. It all, it's all in there. It's that tensegrity thing part of mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah, but as soon as I think especially... Women, especially if, if the woman feels not super athletic for any reason, mm. then the fear is kind of escalated, especially wow. with an aggressive horse. And so this approach or sort of concept, I guess it is, or strategy, it just goes, all you have to do is use a tool you're comfortable with from a distance that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And begin to tell your horse, you can't run away and you can't run me over until your horse shows you the signs that they now want to connect with you, that they start to feel safe in their own skin. Yeah. And that's going to come through as a calming of the energy. That energy level is going to come down rather than escalate. The horse might voluntarily start to look at us going, well, what do you want? And I go, nothing. Mm -hmm. I just want you to feel better. Mm -hmm. Right. And so until the horse sort of shifts out of that dominance of the sympathetic nervous system, I go at halt or walk. We could safely say we want a high dominance of the parasympathetic nervous system right? Because the body isn't under any physical stress. This right. is all mental, emotional. So if we work at halt and walk, and we have these sort of distances for safety, we begin to build a connection only after the fear energy has dissipated. Right. And there's no time frame on that. I got no idea. I don't either. And but you How can long? start to see it with one of the horses I have here. He's finally seeking more of that wonderful attention than and connection. the fight. Mm -hmm. And connection. You know, he's ready. He's 
put, brought down all those barriers that he's tried to finagle. And now yeah. he's like, wow, okay, this is much more pleasant. No, and I know for me, all the instruction I received as a woman who loves her horse and horses, I really cringed internally when I would hear the instruction of you have to be the boss mare, you have to be the dominant horse in the herd, you have to be the lead horse, you have to show them who's boss, you have to um, not let them get away with that. Like none of those things resonated with me. Really? And even the word boundaries, I kind of cringe at the word boundaries because most people I see are setting boundaries in a way that's destroying relationships. Mm. It's not building a relationship, it's destroying it. So I go, boundaries doesn't really resonate with me. I go, non-demanding time where I'm just your friend, ready to help, but waiting on you. That made sense to me. I go, because that's what I would do for a good friend. Right. And if they the want, hold, to, we call it holding space, holding space. I go, if my holding space needs to vent and right or cry or have a meltdown. And I just go, would you like a glass of wine? Like, <laughs> <laughs> but holding your own space. See, that's what, what I think women do is we try to go into the child or the horse's space and fix to, it and fix it fix it yeah and i don't know if that's the a good answer i remember it's not possible yeah when it, I when it comes right down to it we set ourselves up for failure by thinking mm -hmm. we can fix another person true we go we can guide and that's what parents do they guide but they're not trying to, um, how do I want to say, fix the children in their own image. Although I guess I have to say some parents do, but it's yeah, I, yeah, doesn't Sorry. lead to the healthy development of any individual, no. whether it's a kid or a horse. I go, it's it's really sort of a sign of respect for the individual to say, "I'm here to help. Let me know what feels helpful to you." Yeah, and these are my boundaries, not or and, boundaries, or my space. I'm holding my personal space. Yeah, and in the meantime, I have enough self-respect. You don't get to drag me into your drama, and you don't right. get to push me into your drama. My space mm -hmm. is my space, and I have complete free will to choose if I get upset, how I get upset, what I choose to do. I go, I can choose to sort of go, yeah, not here, anywhere right. but here. Right. Right? Because you're starting to disrupt my sense of safety. Mm -hmm. You're starting to disrupt my calmness or happiness. So you just go do you. And over I'm, there. <laughs> I'm going to take care of myself <laughs> over here. Yeah. 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 And whether that you do you is our aggressive horse or you know, screaming child in the grocery store. <laughs> it's like, I've seen so many creative parents do all kinds of things. Cause I go at some point, every kid on the planet is going to have a meltdown. Right? Oh, it happened to me at a, one of those mommy parties. <laughs> <laughs> and my son threw a total temper tantrum. He was banging and slapping his body on the floor. And the other moms were like, aren't you going to do something about that? And I was like, oh, hell no. I'm not getting into that battle. <laughs> That's all his stuff. It, yeah. I'm not giving attention to that. And it's almost like feeding it by, you know, going in and yes. anyway, so... You know, he no, finally and, quit doing it and went back to playing. But, you know, for a parent, it's like such a struggle to see that. And we're embarrassed. Like, All we're kind of, of those embarrassed. emotions go we're... through, like, who, you know, are they going to call the cops on me or child services? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> and we're feeling the judgment of every yeah, other mother in the that. room. And yes. it comes with horses, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You no, know, and it's really an empowering place for us to sort of take this Wonder Woman stance and then go, I'm just going to wait this out. 
I go, yeah. because if you try to control energy or keep a lid on it, it energy on it. has Oof. a way of coming out sideways at the worst yeah, possible does, time. Right. I go, but if I just let that individual spend the energy, they're going to feel better. And I don't have to waste any of my energy while they're going through that process. That has nothing right. to do with me unless I decide it's up to me to fix it, which I go really isn't as possible as we think it is because everybody's got so. their own process. You can't reach in there and change the chemistry or the nervous system. No, it has to be the um, self carriage thing is that the self has to find it yeah, or want it or seek it, you know? Yeah. And it isn't like horses and humans, life is life. We're going to have stressful moments. We're going to have challenges. We're going to have fear responses, but how we deal with it exactly. means we either become unhealthy or we become more resilient. We start yeah. to bounce back from these moments faster and faster with less drama. And right. ultimately, the power of the nervous system and even the chemical system in our bodies that we call emotions, I go, safety feels good. Yeah, it does. Everybody wants it. So I go, it's just a matter of letting sort of that pot boil off <laughs> let that steam go until you know but if I turn up the heat it's only going to boil more right if I turn down the heat my part of the equation I go let the steam and the boiling continue until it's done mm -hmm. right just let it go somewhere so, and like I said, I'll just reiterate my favorite saying as a kind of closing. I know we got to wrap it up, but horses, I still stumble <laughs> over so it. Funny. I love it. <laughs> horses convinced against their will are of the same opinion still. Mm -hmm. And by convincing, I mean fighting, leverage, dominance and submission, obedience, right? You can convince a horse to do something as a pain avoidance, but that doesn't change how they feel about it. Right. Right. So that's a good point. It's going to come out somewhere. And if we don't change how an aggressive horse feels, we're going to be, you know, we're going to have to learn some horsemanship kung fu to protect ourselves because horses get right. really athletic and really good at fighting humans the more they fight the right. more the human fights back the better the horse gets at fighting if we don't enter the argument the horse fights against themselves until they spend that energy and then they go oh yeah now i feel better oh yeah. you still here <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final words from you? Nope. Nothing to add? Sounds good. Just maintain your own bubble, your own space. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's the only thing we really can we control. Can that's it. And that's true just for humans. That's the only, we only get one of these. Yeah. These <laughs> so take good care of it and create your own bubble space. Yeah, because it is literally the only thing that we have complete control over exactly. in our lives. Exactly. Yeah. And that aggressive horse is here to prove it. <laughs> yeah. They're great teachers, aren't they now? Yes. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us. We hope you lasted through the whole podcast. We look forward to seeing you next time. And thanks again for picking up that bottle in the ocean, uncorking it and finding <laughs> our little podcast or finding this information. And we hope it's very helpful. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.